Good morning, everyone. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. We're continuing our worship by conference call during the uh, COVID-19 lockdown here in 2020. And uh, I'm doing the Bible reading and sermon again for anybody who uh, wasn't able to be with us and uh, would like to hear it. I'm reading from Philippians 1, verses 18 to 26. I remind you that Paul is writing these uh, verses from prison to the church in Philippi. I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but that I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, that I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Amen. As Paul writes this letter to the Philippians, he's worried about something. He's worried about the future, his future. He's been imprisoned by an authoritarian regime, and you would think that he would be worried about whether he lives or dies, whether he will be spared or executed. But he claims that's not his primary concern. Well, maybe we'll come back to that. But I think the primary answer is in verse 20. He says something interesting here. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage. He's worried about the future and he has a dual concern. He wants to avoid doing anything that could make him ashamed. More positively, he wants to act with courage and boldness. He senses that a time of testing is coming and he wants to pass the test. Perhaps we can relate to that. We are in a time of testing too. I mean that at several levels. We as individuals, we as a church, we as a town, we as a country, humans collectively as a world. I have hope that when people look back on the pandemic of 2020, that we will not be put to shame and that we will have given a good account of ourselves, that we will have acted with courage. I guess that's what it means to be in a time of testing. You don't really know how you will act until you're in it. Paul doesn't know how he will act. That's why he uses language like, I eagerly expect and hope. Fortunately, he knows he isn't alone in this. He may be alone in a prison cell, but he isn't alone in the situation. Listen to verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Did you hear that? He is relying on the Spirit of Christ and on the prayers of the church. My friends, those are good things to rely on. In this time of crisis, let us also rely on the prayers of the church and the spirit of Christ. And let us pray for others that they will not feel ashamed and that they will have courage. It's important because there's a lot of fear and anger out there. Some people are looking for someone to blame, someone to turn their frustration on. And I pray that we, as a society, will not be put to shame by such impulses. I pray that when they look back on the pandemic of 2020 from the future, that we will be seen to have been standing together with courage and mutual concern. 
And it's hard to face a disease that is killing thousands, especially a disease that is as unpredictable as this one. You can get it and not know you have it, even unknowingly give it to others. It's generally easier on young people than older, but there are no guarantees. Some young people have died. And when you get down to it, it's hard to stare death in the face. It's hard to know that some virus out there could possibly take your life or the lives of your loved ones. As one ancient author said, we all shudder at death. We do need each other's prayers and the spirit of Christ. Only through them can we begin to have the sort of attitude that Paul had about life and death. He had prayed about his situation and seems to have arrived at a place where he could actually be indifferent about whether he lived or died. In verse 21, he wrote, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If he lives, he lives for Christ, and if he dies, he departs to be with Christ, which is better by far. He's content to stay and be about the work that God has laid out for him. Yet he looks forward to a future heavenly existence with God. That is a delicate balancing point, hard to maintain. I doubt that even Paul maintained it 24-7. But I hope that you can see how desirable it is. That kind of faith only grows out of a lifetime of knowing God. I mentioned this word indifference as to whether one lives or dies. Some spiritual authors like that word. I like that word, indifference, because it means that we aren't attached to any idols or things of this world more than we are to God. But I want to make it clear that when I use that word, I do not mean that we have ceased to love our lives. Of course we love our lives. God gave them to us. But as Christians, we need not fear death. This is the season of Easter. Just as Christ rose from the dead, so shall we. Someday we shall follow him down that path that begins in shadow and ends in glorious light. And then we will see that it is all okay. In life and in death, we belong to the God who loves us and cares for us. Like Paul in verse 23, we can see that the resurrection life in Christ is better by far. But in the meantime, we remain, as Paul did, and continue with each other for our mutual progress and joy in the faith. I'm going to close with Paul's last words from chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. Whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Amen. We, uh, we sang the hymn, Blessed Assurance, in our service, and I'm going to give a shot at one verse a cappella uh, as a little bit of an encore. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. May God bless you, and may you feel you have much to give praise for, and um, we'll talk to you next week.